Hi, this is Larry Mantle, host of Air Talk on KPCC. Since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, we've had a daily segment on Air Talk devoted to the latest information about COVID-19. As time's gone on, we've looked at vaccines and how the virus and pandemic have affected the lives of Southern Californians. That includes doctors, nurses, epidemiologists, and other medical professionals fighting the virus on the front lines. In each episode of this podcast, we'll speak with one of our experts on the rotating panel of AirTalk guests. They'll be sharing their expertise with us daily. You can also listen anytime at las.com kpecc.org, or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. We're joined by Dr. Kimberly Schreiner, Director of Infectious Disease and Prevention at Pasadena's Huntington Hospital. Dr. Schreiner, very good to have you with us on this Tuesday when we're hearing from KPCC supporters. And I just have to say, we hear so much appreciation for you personally. You, You have really become a beloved figure in our community. Well, thank you so very much, Larry. You have terrific listeners, and I'm always impressed with the quality and depth of their questions and and the the job that you've done over these last two very difficult years has just been amazing. So congratulations to you and your entire team. Well, thank you. And uh, speaking of questions, those terrific questions from listeners, we're taking them right now. You can email them at atcomments at kpcc.org. Please remember to include your location and your first name. Similarly, if you're tweeting at AirTalk, please add to your Twitter handle your location as well. Just really helps give a sense of place and what is the largest conversation in all of Southern California. And we love being able to show that it extends from the Coachella Valley to Santa Barbara County and even beyond with listeners on the app and listening at kpcc.org. You can also call us at 866-888-5722-866. I'm sorry, 893-KPCC. I was giving the call-in pledge number. (laughs) Sorry. 866-893-KPCC. And Matt D'Angelo Antonio, who is line producing, said he was at Rosie's Dog Beach in Long Beach over the weekend, ended up talking to an Altadena resident, an AirTalk listener, who, who mentioned Dr. Schreiner by name. I love that, Dr. Schreiner. So nice to hear about that, Matt. Thanks for passing that on. 866-893-KPCC. Six six eight nine three KPCC. So, Dr. Schreiner, the FDA announced this morning that it recommends uh, that there be a second booster shot available to Americans age fifty and older. This, of course, is pending the CDC's recommendation. But what do you think about the FDA going this direction? Well, I think we knew it was coming, and um, I, you know, I think everybody's a little bit disappointed that three shots may not be enough, uh, at least in, in those of us who are over 50 and some of us who are over 60. So, um, But it does make good science uh, and good sense because um, there's a pretty good study that came out uh, just a couple weeks ago. It's in preprint uh, fashion right now with the from the Israelis, but it was fairly convincing. It was a retrospective study that showed a significant difference in mortality, uh, not just hospitalization, but in mortality in individuals who had received uh, the fourth booster as opposed to those that only had three. Now, you know, we know that the the booster is highly effective. And uh, when you look at the statistics from the, uh, the last Omicron surge, there was no question that those individuals that were boosted, fully boosted and vaccinated, uh, really did much, much better than people that just had only received two vaccines, and certainly much better than individuals who had uh, were unvaccinated. So, The boosting really does help. And what it does is increase the amount of antibodies, both in your nose, where you first encounter the virus, and also in your immune system. And we know that this BA2 variant, which we're watching very carefully, is, believe it or not, uh, twice as infectious as the BA1 Omicron variant, which is hard to believe, but that's a a pretty well documented now in a couple of studies. So I think that for individuals that are higher risk for having a a tough time with COVID that the fourth booster is a good idea. It is safe. It may give you a little bit of a reaction. I had one on my third booster, uh, but they're very safe and it's probably prudent to kind of get us through the summer and whatever this BA2 surge looks like in the next few weeks and months. Now, you said third booster. Did you mean your your booster to your other two, or you mean actually a third booster? Third shot. My yeah, third okay, shot. your third shot, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, because I'm, I'm a Moderna 
person uh, and have had that all along. Do you still recommend for those getting a booster of Moderna that the second booster be that half dose that they use for the booster? Yeah, I think the data on that's pretty good, Larry. And I think that, you know, again, it's a booster. It's already taking what you already have and just kind of tickling your immune system and saying, okay, wake up a little bit. We've got some trouble circulating here. Uh, And so I think that the half dose for Moderna seems to be quite uh, immunogenic. uh, And for the folks that, like I myself, who receive Pfizer, uh, you will receive a full dose of Pfizer. There are no data that suggests that a full dose uh, of Moderna is better than a half dose uh, at this point. So I think that uh, that's a fine thing to do. So when you go to get your shot, you know, say that I'm I'm here for my fourth, my second booster, the the half dose of Moderna. If, if you want to stay with Moderna, you can switch to Pfizer. Uh, there's no problem doing that. Um, there's not probably any particular advantage unless it just is available at the day that you decide to get boosted. Okay, so it, that was you uh, anticipated my next question, which is going to be: Do you and you, should people consider getting something other than what they've had before? But it, you're seeing them as largely interchangeable. Yeah, they really are. They're they're very very similar. The Moderna one is maybe a little bit more immunogenic, but in the grand scheme of things, it's it's not statistically significant really. So I think that uh, both of them are fine. And you know, I think we have to be realistic that there's probably another booster heading our way in the fall uh, because we do. Most of us think that that's probably when we'll have a bigger surge. Um, you know, I think we have to keep an eye on what's happening in Europe. The BA2 variant is is quickly becoming the dominant variant globally. Um, the uh, troubles in Ukraine may be feeding some of that. Uh, it's common when there's large migrations of people that pandemics kind of accelerate a little bit. So I think um, those are things we're concerned about. And then, of course, the possibility of another variant that comes along that actually evades the vaccines. That's of, of concern as well. So it's probably prudent to play it safe. Yeah, and where are we at on on a potential pan coronavirus vaccine, which would provide much wider ranging protection? Is, is is that in clinical trials yet or not? I don't believe it's in clinical trials, but it is. <clears throat> uh, they are working fast on it at um, uh, the American uh, at the Army uh, Research Institute. I think that Fauci's lab is looking into that. There's quite a bit of interest in that. And that could be a significant game changer when it comes to this pandemic and perhaps others that come down the road uh, using a little bit different type of technology with antibodies uh, that would um, provide coverage for many different uh, pathogens, um, perhaps even outside of of SARS-CoV-2, and also be uh, perhaps something that doesn't require boosting frequently. Now, um, with this advice, which presumably the CDC will will concur with the FDA and and recommend for um, older Americans, um, why is it we're not seeing a modified mRNA vaccine that has, you know, plug and play technology to better cover Omicron and then presumably by extension, the BA2 subvariant? Well, right now, the current vaccine covers it quite well. And um, uh, what the problem is, uh, is this decline in antibodies, which is separate from what your T and B cells, which are part of the uh, cellular immune system. That's the memory part of your immune system. And for this particular bug, Uh, SARS-CoV-2, you sort of have to have that frontline defense with the antibodies to prevent infection. The T and B cells help you fight off the infection once you get it, and so that you don't get really sick and have to go to the hospital and hopefully not perish from it. Uh, But in terms of actually getting infected, uh, the T and B cells are not very helpful because it takes them a few days to kind of get ramped up. And so we know that the vaccines work right now for all of the Omicron subvariants, um, and they do what they're supposed to do, which is protect you from serious illness and death. I I think that uh, many virologists and infectious disease doctors are concerned about the fact that this is more infectious and, uh, and then it can still cause a significant amount of disease, especially in our more vulnerable populations. And so uh, for that reason, um, they're encouraging this booster. But for right now, the booster should do the trick. Uh, Pfizer has developed an Omicron-specific uh, vaccine, um, but I think that the feeling has been, it's first of all, there's manufacturing issues that, to deploy the whole thing, and it may be sort of behind the be too late if another variant emerges. So for now, we know the current vaccines we have available do cover uh, this uh, variant, uh, BA2, 
and um, and that should be enough to get us through until maybe the fall when we have perhaps a little bit different version. We were hearing that um, there was an abundance of vaccine out there and not enough takers for it. Uh, do you think there likely is enough vaccine for people to get an additional booster and to meet the demand? Because there, if it's going to be for people over 50, that's a significant segment of the population. Yes, my understanding is there's plenty of vaccine out there. We Our booster uptake was not uh, as good as we thought it should have been, which sort of is baffling because those are individuals who certainly got their first, first two vaccines. Yeah. So it didn't seem to be vaccine hesitant, but I think there just was kind of this fatigue that happened that people sort of weren't interested in getting a booster. It was critically important. When you look at the data from the January surge of the first Omicron, uh, the difference between just vaccinated and vaccinated and boosted was pretty significant. And so I, I strongly encourage people, if you haven't had your third shot, your first booster, please get it right now. Uh, that'll hold you through the summer. And then uh, if you've already, if you're four to six months out of your third shot, your first booster, then go ahead and get a fourth booster um, if you're over 50 years old. So four to six months. And what about for people who've recently had COVID? How how long should they ideally wait uh, to ride out that natural immunity before they have a booster? That's an interesting question. Initially, we thought that that, that didn't last too long, but there's some data now that's coming out, Larry, that looks that people that are that have um, been vaccinated and then got COVID or vice versa, they had COVID and then been vaccinated, uh, have really robust uh, antibody levels and, um, and that they, uh, they may, that may last a little bit longer. Now that's, we're not recommending getting COVID. It's not something you want to get. Yeah. Right. Um, but for those that did have it, it seems to be quite good. You know, the sort of the adage is around 90 days or, you know, but if, if it just is a month or two, it's probably not going to hurt you. The vaccines are very safe. They're not going to hurt you. You may have a reaction, especially if you did have COVID recently, just kind of have a fever and feel kind of fatigued for 24 hours. But those go away, and um, and you just really want to get vaccinated. The other really important piece to this is that the vaccines protect you from long COVID. We have Bob in Studio City who emailed his question, I'm 65 years old and a sustaining member. Bob, I appreciate it. That'll help keep you healthy. He said, I've had two doses and a booster of Pfizer. Should my second booster also be Pfizer, or would it be better and offer better protection to get Moderna or even J&J? And Dr. Schreiner, we didn't talk about that. For those of us that have had mRNA vaccines, should we consider J&J? Because it's performed pretty well with Omicron. It has, um, but I think at this juncture, I would probably not recommend J&J for being a boosting uh, choice. If it's the only thing available, uh, then it's fine. Um, J&J's had a few more problems with a little bit of clotting issues and so forth, and so uh, the mRNA vaccines, I think, in the long run have performed better, um, and I think it's probably better to sort of stay in that genre. But it's been do- it's been done around the world. The Brits have done a lot of that with AstraZeneca. Not J, they don't have J and J, but they use AstraZeneca, their RNA va- or their uh, uh, adenovirus vaccine with uh, Pfizer. So it's been done. But I, I would sort of stick with the mRNA. And for um, the listener, I would say that just um, uh, Pfizer or Moderna are fine. There's no advantage to picking one or the other. Whatever you can get first, and whatever you feel comfortable doing, they're both satisfactory. All right. Doug in Irvine emailed us, uh, for a senior who got a booster last fall, when would be the optimal time for the second booster? Would you recommend getting it as soon as possible or waiting a bit in hopes of being better protected against the next wave? You know, that's kind of the question we've all had. Most of us, uh, I was vaccinated or boosted in October, and so I'm more than about six months out now. So I think four to six months is kind of when the uh, antibody levels really begin to uh, decline. And so any time now is probably a good idea to do it to sort of get us through this BA2 blip, whatever that may be. I hope it's more of a blip than a surge, but we'll just have to see. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, I think if if he was vaccinated or boosted in the fall, then it's time to get the, four, the second booster. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to find other questions here. Oh, Stephen Burbank, if someone's HIV positive but medically controlled is over 50 and had a first booster, should they get a second booster shot? I think it's a good idea. Uh, Well-controlled HIV disease uh, in and of itself, um, uh, individuals do fine if they are, or don't have a, seem to have an increased problem when they get COVID. Uh, uncontrolled HIV disease is a different story. 
but I think I would still recommend that you're still kind of falling into that category where it's probably better to really have a robust uh, immune defense against COVID. So I would recommend a booster. And all, I take care of lots of patients with HIV, and I would recommend that they, they get their second booster. Lucille in Long Beach says, I'm 64 and have my three Pfizer shots. I got an antibody test done recently, and it came back showing I still have very high antibody levels, uh, even though I got the booster over six months ago. Should I still seek out getting a second booster, even with those high antibody levels? Well, that's the question. Um, We don't like to use antibody levels as a direction for whether or not you need to get another booster per se, because there's sort of more to the story than that quantitative analysis. Um, You know, that being said, I've had a patient that um, had COVID recently and had had gotten the booster fairly uh, shortly after that, and her antibody levels were sky high. So, um, you know, I think I, I don't, there are not a lot of directions in terms of using antibody levels other than if you don't respond to the vaccines in terms of what your your um, just your plan should be for boosting. If they're really, really high and you want to wait, then you can sort of probably think that you do have enough to, to make it through, but they can start dropping rather precipitously. So I still would kind of follow a temporal pattern rather than the antibody levels. All right, 866-893-5722, or you can email your question for Dr. Schreiner at atcomments at kpcc.org. You know, there's a lot of of research I know being done on long COVID and and symptoms that don't abate with, with some of the more immediate ones. Brain fog is something that people have talked about as being a lasting effect of, of COVID. And there's thought that might overlap with what's called Called chemo brain, or even with symptoms of Alzheimer's, and um, do you think that there may be, uh, you know, parts of the brain that uh, are are getting similarly affected by COVID as with those other conditions? Yes, I think so, Larry. And I think that uh, I just did a couple of uh, lectures on long COVID last week and uh, just reviewed some fascinating literature. And I think that um, one of the benefits, if there is a benefit somewhere in this horrible pandemic is that we're learning a lot about how infectious diseases and how the immune system interact with each other and how they can cause chronic illnesses, not just acute illnesses. And the uh, evaluation and study of individuals with long COVID, especially in the brain, which it can commonly affect, is very interesting in terms of the inflammatory things that happen. Uh, And in fact, it appears to be more the inflammation system gets kind of misguided by the virus and that produces uh, chronic inflammation that destroys the neural, uh, the gray matter, the parts of the neurons. And that some pathologic data coming out now uh, in individuals who have expired from COVID looking at their brain compared to individuals who may have expired from Alzheimer's or other chronic neurologic illnesses, there's some similarities. And so it's possible that, that uh, it certainly it's increasing our knowledge about the brain and how inflammatory issues can affect and create disease, but it's a fascinating uh, observation, and I think it requires a great deal more study, but I think could be very, very helpful for other kinds of illnesses, um, not just virologic ones. Uh, we have a question from uh, Linda Beth in Chatsworth, who emailed us, says, I got somewhat sick with all three of my Moderna shots, still beat the alternative of getting COVID, but should I consider a different shot for my additional booster, You know, given the side effects she had before? You can, um, you know, what's your, that's your immune system responding. That's your immune system saying, I know what this is, and I'm going to give you a little fever and achy bones and make you feel tired for 24 hours or so. Most people, it goes away within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, sometimes it can last a little bit longer. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of data on whether sort of switching to Pfizer if you've had reactions to Moderna is going to make that much difference because they're really both doing the same thing. So just make sure that for your Moderna booster, you're getting the half dose and not the full dose. All right. And uh, finally, we have only a minute left, but Fer- Ferdinand tweets at AirTalk, is getting a COVID booster every six months going to be the new norm? We hope not. That's where a pan-coronavirus will become helpful uh, and our understanding it improves in terms of developing perhaps an annual or even maybe every three or four years kind of vaccine, but we have to see. All right. Dr. Schreiner, 
Uh, just speaking on behalf of our listeners, I appreciate you so much. They do too. Thank you for your generosity of time. As busy as you are, I always marvel at how willing you are, even as today, to come on to talk longer to us because of the news that we got about the FDA recommendation on the booster. So thank you for being so responsive and so generous with your time. It's always my pleasure, Larry. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of COVID in L.A. If you'd like to stay up to date with the latest coronavirus news, you can listen anytime at las.com, at kpecc.org, or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. See you next time and stay safe. I'm Larry Mantle.